Hello Emerging Importers and Exporters. This video is to orientate you on tariff classification. The most important thing I think that I want to share with you today is this as an emerging importer and exporter. Understanding tariff classification will bring you to the place of knowing what information you need to put into your product literature. And why, if you're importing, why it is absolutely important for you to make sure that you have literature uh, so you have literature to manage your risk of a non-compliance. So those are the things that the tariff classification will help you with. Now, the RNI's Commodity Description and Coding System, it's actually developed by the World Customs Organization. And the nomenclature the system itself has 21 sections, it has 99 chapters, and within the chapters there are headings within the chapter. So for example, if you see a tariff heading or a tariff code, 0102.21, what it means is 01 means chapter 1, 02 means the heading within the chapter, and 21 means the subheading within the heading. So that's what it means. The tariff heading has three parts to it. The chapter, the heading, and the subheading. In some instances, you'll find that the tariff heading has the seventh and the eighth digit. The seventh and the eighth digit are always on a national level. It is country specific. The first six digits are international. It's used internationally. And I want to quickly give you an aerial view of the 97 chapters in the Armonize system so that you'll understand, you'll have a basic understanding of how it works. Now, all movable goods come from two sources, organic and inorganic. Organic means anything comes from animal, or plant origin. Inorganic means anything that comes from under the earth. So the nomenclature or the tariff codes are based or, or, or put together as such. It starts with organic goods and then it moves to inorganic. So organic, it starts with animals first because organic comes from two sources, animal and plant. So it starts with chapter one being live animals. Then it goes to chapter two, which is edible meat and offals. Chapter three is fish. Chapter four is dairy produce. Chapter five, other products of animal origin. So once the animal section is covered, the first five chapters, then it moves to chapter six, which is the plant under organic. And from chapter six, you will find the following. Chapter 6 is about trees, roots, flowers. Chapter 7, edible vegetable. Chapter 8, edible fruits. Chapter 9, coffee, tea. Chapter 10, cereals. That's on the farm. Chapter 11, where you move the wheat and the corn and so on to a mill where you mill the stuff or you produce flour and that's chapter 11. Chapter 12 is oil seeds. Chapter 13 is gum and resins in a natural form. And chapter 14 is vegetable platting material. So you'll find that from chapter 1 to 5, organic, animal. Chapter 6 to 14, plant, organic. And then you go to chapter 15, which is um, animal and vegetable fats and oils. So in other words, chapter 15 can come from anywhere from chapter 1 to chapter 14. And then chapter 16, you've got preparations of meat or fish. Again, it can come from anywhere from chapter 1 to chapter 15. In chapter 17, again, is sugars and sweets that comes from plant. Chapter 18, cocoa, that comes from plant. Chapter 19, preparations of cereals. 
that could be plant and animal product. Chapter 20, preparations of vegetable, fruit and nut. Chapter 21, other edible preparations. Chapter 22, beverages. Chapter 23, waste products from plant and animal. Chapter 24, tobacco. So once you come to the point of chapter 24, you basically, you're done with organic from animal and plant, and then you move to chapter 25, which is inorganic, under the earth. Chapter 25 is the first level of the earth. You get salt, you get earth, you get stone. When you go to the next level of the earth, that's chapter 26. That's where you get your ores from. And you come to chapter 27, fossil fuels that can come from chapter 1 right up to chapter 26. The next chapter is 28. 28 is inorganic chemicals. That means chemicals that's coming from under the earth and they are chemicals in the raw form. Predominantly these chemicals in the chemical formula will not have a C with the exception of a few that has a C but most of them don't have a C, they don't have carbon. That's chapter 28. Chapter 29 is organic chemicals. In organic chemicals, those are chemicals that are derived from plant and animal. And the chemical formula for organic chemicals, more predominantly most of them will have carbon in it. Now, once you have chapter 29, from chapter 30 to 97, it is goods that are derived from anywhere from chapter 1 to chapter 29. So for example, chapter 30 that follows chapter 29 is pharmaceutical. Pharmaceuticals you can get from plant, you can get from animal, or you can bring it from under the earth. The next one is fertilizer from plant, from animal, or chemicals under the earth. The next one, 32, dyes, paints, plant, animal and stuff under the earth and so you go on further now 33 chapter 33 is essential oils and cosmetics chapter 4 34 his soaps and washing preparation chapter 35 starches and glues chapter 36 explosives 37 photographic materials 38 other chemicals 39 plastic 40 rubber 41 skins and leather, 42 leather articles, 43 fur, 44 wood, 45 cork, 46 articles of plating material, 47 pulp, 48 paper, 49 printed matter. From 50 onwards, you go into textiles. So 50 is silk textiles, 52 cotton, 53 vegetable textile fiber fibers, 54 man made. 55 uh, man-made, sorry, 54 is man-made filaments, 55 man-made staple, 56 is felt and non-woven, 57 is carpets, 58 is special woven fabrics, 59 is coated fabrics, 60 is knitted fabrics, 61 is knitted garments, 62 is other garments, 63 is textile articles, 64 is footwear, 65 is headgear, 60. 6 is umbrella, 67 is artificial flowers and wigs, 68 is articles of stone, 69 is ceramic product. <clears throat> so the next chapter that, that follows chapter 69 is 70, that's glass, 71 is precious metal, 72 is iron and steel or steel, 73 is articles of iron or steel, 74 is copper, 75 is nickel, 76 is aluminium, 77 is reserved currently, 78 is lead, 79 is zinc, 80 is tin, 81 is other base metals, 82 is tools, 83 is articles of base metal, 84 is machinery, 85 is electrical goods, 86 is railways and 87 is motor vehicles. Up to that point, to 87, that could be any product that's made and exported by what you would consider 
emerging economies. The advanced nations would be anything from 88 to 93. And chapter 88 has to do with the aerospace industry, 89, ships and boats, 90, chapter 90, which is scientific equipment, 91 is clocks and watches, 92 is musical instrument, 93 is arms and ammunition. And then after that, you get miscellaneous articles that can be manufactured either by the less developed economies, the emerging economies, or the advanced nation. And that would be 94, which is furniture. 95 is toys, games, and sports equipment. 96 is miscellaneous manufactured articles. And 97 is art. Now, within the 97 chapters that I just list, listed to you, one of the ways to understand it is that it starts with natural products and then it progresses into raw materials and then to semi-finished goods and then ultimately to finished goods. So the point here, from chapter 1 to 97, there is a vertical progression of value creation. As you go up the value chain, you'll find that there's a, the product is of a higher value. Within the tariff heading, there's also a horizontal value chain that can be seen. For example, in chapter 44, which is the chapter on wood, it starts off with fuel wood, then as you go to 4401, 442, 443, 4404 and continue, you'll find that you'll, you'll, you'll progress into from fuel wood to timber to articles of wood. And so the entire nomenclature is structured around value creation. Now, the goods within the R&I system is classified according to composition, according to form, according to function. For example, you can have a picture frame. Wood is chapter 44, plastic, chapter 39, and metal, chapter 83. And so classification is according to composition. Classification is also according to form. The example is potatoes. If it's fresh or chilled, it's heading 0701. But if the, if the potatoes is cooked by steaming or boiling in water and then frozen, then the heading is 0710. So form also decides where the goods are classified. Another thing that, that's important to understand classification, and that's function. The example here is that if you have a detector and the detector can detect CO2 emissions and then it has a display for gas measurements and the heading that you would use to classify that is 9027 but if you just have a, de a vapor detector a gas detector a flame detector the classification will be 8531 so the point I make here is classification is based on composition, classification is based on form, and classification can be based on function. Now, you can import or export anything you can dream or think or imagine. You can blow your breath in a, in a balloon and want to export it if it's worth anything. Now, the point I make here is that if you have to have a code for every single item that can be imported or exported, can you imagine how big the book will be? So that's not possible. So what the classifiers have done, every single product or article or raw material that can be imported or exported, they've put them in 97 categories, 97 chapters. And then they have formulated six rules that people need to use to find the right chapter and the right heading for their goods. 
Rule 1 says classification is determined by first the word, wording or text of heading or any relevant legal notes. So the first rule is this, if you have a product and if you can find a heading that specifically mentions this product and you've got no problem, that's your classification. But then you might have another issue. You have a incomplete product, a shirt, the sleeves are missing, the collar is missing, it's an incomplete. So it's not possible to have a tariff heading for complete and incomplete, then that would even make the book even bigger. So rule 2a says this, the heading includes incomplete or unfinished goods and unassembled or disassemb disassembled goods. In other words, if you've got a product that is resembles the finished product but it's not complete yet, then you will find the tariff heading for the completed the complete article and that's what your classification will be. Rule 2b says this, you might have a product where it's got more than one composition. For example, you would have a shirt, 65% nylon, 35% cotton. Now you've got a problem. Is it a nylon shirt or a cotton shirt? So rule 2b says that a tariff heading where there's a specific mention to the composition, it doesn't mean it's solely of that composition. It can also include mixtures and combinations of other goods and raw materials. And then you go to rule 3. Rule 3 says this, if you have a product where it can fall in two tariff headings, uh, for example, you have a, a watch and in the watch there's also a calculator. And so now you don't know whether this is a calculator or a watch. So you have to then use rule 3a, rule 3b or rule 3c to determine whether this is essentially a watch or essentially whether it's a calculator. 3a says this, you, where you've got a product that can fall within two tariff headings, then the first rule is this, 3a says you would choose the heading that spe specifically describes the product. For example, um, you might have a carpet that for a car and it's shaped to be placed in at the driver's seat on the floor. Now you've got two tariff headings there. One is carpets, which is chapter 57, and the other one is accessories for motor vehicle. Now the rule says, 3A says, you would choose the heading that provides the most specific description. And the most specific description is carpets, not accessories of motor vehicles. Accessories of motor vehicles is far more general than, than carpets. So in that instant, the classification for carpets for motor cars will be chapter 57 and not chapter 87. Uh, you might have another situation where you might have a, a baby seat and the baby seat uh, comes with a set of batteries and because you can set the baby seat to rock in six different speeds it can come with toys attached to the seat and you can have musical apparatus to it. So now the question is, is it a baby seat, is it toys or is it a musical instrument? So rule 3b says when you have a product like that, then you will classify that as the goods having the essential character. Now essentially it is a seat and therefore the classification will be chapter 94 which is or 94.1 which is a seat but you might have another situation where you might want to 
give this as a gift. You're either importing it or you're exporting it. It's a cup, and in this cup, and because we are now in a COVID-19 crisis, and in this cup you have placed a sanitizer, a little bottle sanitizer, and you also um, put a yeast egg because it's around the time of Easter, and you're selling this as a set. Now, this cannot be considered a set. It's not complementary. The cup, the yeast egg, and the hand sanitizer, they're not complementary with each other. If anything, even though you might put them as a set because it's a gift, classification, each product must have its separate value and be classified separately. In other words, the cup will have its own tariff heading, the yeast egg will have its own tariff heading, and the hand sanitizer will have its own tariff heading because they're not a set. The three rules, 3A, 3B, and 3C, you have a product that's still classifiable within two tariff headings. Then the rule is you will use the tariff heading that appears in the last numerical order. So in choosing the last numerical order, what the classifiers have done is they're asking you to choose the tariff heading that's the highest in the value chain. Now, if you, one of the problems with, with the r &I system and, the, and the, the pace of technology, how fast things are changing, is that you might not have a tariff heading for a particular product that just come out of the market. And that's why you have rule four, where you choose the closest relative. It's called, uh, the word that you use is most akin. The closest tariff heading to the product. Uh, let's assume you have a, a product or an article or a equipment um, that can instant, like a microwave, where you put a cup of water um, within 30 seconds to a minute you can have hot water. Uh, let's assume you have another equipment where you put a cup of water in it and in 60 seconds you get frozen water in a cup. Now there is no telemedicine for such equipment but the closest relative to that would be a refrigerator. And then rule 5a says this, it says where you have a product that's being imported, let's say you are importing spectacles, this will be classified under chapter 90, and it comes with a, a case. And the purpose of this case is to prolong the, the, the use of the spectacles. In other words, it protects the lifespan of the spectacles. And Rule 5a says that where both of them are imported together, then the classification will be this, the spectacle, chapter 90, and you would ignore this. But if they were imported separately, this came on a separate aircraft or ship, the classification will be chapter 90, and later on you brought this to pack them to use as cases for spectacle later on this came on another vessel then this will be classified under chapter 42 that's how the rules work um, then you have rule 5b that talks about um, packaging material so there's a, a peanut butter bottle now the purpose of the, the glass, the jar, is to convey the peanut butter. So rule, five say, rule 5b says the packaging material and the contents must be classified under the same heading. So for the purpose of the classification, you, you will ignore the packaging material. You classify the entire thing as peanut butter. But on the same token, you might have a situation like this, where you've got spices in a jar. Now the purpose of this jar is repetitive use. 
it's not so much just to convey the spices in it. After the spices are used, you can still use this jar for something else. And where you have a case like this, the spices will be classified separately and the jar will be classified separately under chapter 70. And then you have the final rule, which is rule 6. Rule 6 says this, it says, when you have used all the five rules and you've come to a tariff heading, and within the tariff heading, you've got sub headings. Rule 6 shows you how to classify goods within the sub heading. And so it actually says you will start to apply rule 1 first, rule 2a, rule 2b, and if that fails, rule 3a, 3b, 3c, and so on. And often they use the word other. It means within the scope of goods in that tariff heading. If there is no heading that specifically describes your goods, then it will be classified under other within that heading. Now, in South Africa, there is a custom directive on the principles of tariff classification. And the directive says that it's a three-stage process the first thing is, you have to ascertain the meaning of the words in a heading. Once you've done that, then you look at the nature and the characteristics of the goods. And the third thing is, then you select the heading most appropriate to the goods that you're classifying. Now, the other thing is, within the tariff heading, there is quite a bit of punctuation marks. There is comma, there's semicolon, there's colon, and there's a full stop. Now the good example is heading 4202. You'll see a whole list of goods, trunks, suitcases, vanity cases, and then it has a semicolon. And then there's a second list of goods, travel bags, insulated food or beverage bags, and so the semicolon, what it does, it, it subdivides the, the contents of that tariff heading into two subgroups. Where the semicolon is, there's the first group, and after the semicolon, there's a second group. Before the semicolon, you'll find it doesn't state what material the goods must be. In other words, it can be any material. After the semicolon, you'll find the material has to be of leather, of plastic, textile, or paper. And so it's important to understand punctuations within a tariff heading. A comma in a tariff heading is basically used to separate the items. A colon indicates that there's going to be further subdivisions that will occur. And a full stop means that's the end of the text. Now, whether you're an importer or exporter, you need a clearing agent to help you with the tariff classification of goods. The purpose of this video is to show you that tariff classification in itself is a complex process. And you as an importer or exporter, if you don't have the right information, then the chances are your clearing agent that you're using will not be able to determine the tariff heading correctly. And that places you under a huge risk of non-compliance. The Customs Duty Act says this, the tariff classification is self-determination by the importer or exporter. If you make a mistake, you have to notify customs of the inaccuracy promptly. In other words, you have to pass an amending document to amend the error. If you don't do that, in the case of a post audit, then customs can redetermine the tariff heading and they can redetermine what they redetermined. And this is what I've been trying to tell you is this, 
as an import and exporter, you are not an expert on tariff classification. But you need to understand that how important literature, product literature is for classification. It's absolutely important for you as an exporter in when you're developing your product literature to have these things in mind. What's the composition? How will it function? What are the principal or secondary uses for the item? What marketing claims will you make? Don't put one thing in the literature and something, something else on the website because that will be conflicting. Is the product finished goods, sub-assembly? And does it have a standalone function? How will it be packaged? Put a picture of the product in, the, um, in your literature. If I say to you chalk, what comes to your mind? To your mind? is the chalk that a teacher uses to write on a board. But chalk can also mean a rock. So when you have chalk on an invoice, does it mean you're selling or you're buying something that the teacher would use to write on a board? Or does it mean you're importing or exporting a rock? Uh, if you are importing or exporting a shirt, question, is it a men's shirt or a lady shirt? Is it knitted or woven? Is it silk or man-made fibers? Is it lo long sleeve, short sleeve? Does it have a collar? No collar. So you'll see this shirt means nothing. So it is absolutely important for you to understand the importance of literature when you're classifying goods. And in South Africa, where there's a dispute between you and customs, then you apply for a firm tariff ruling. When you get the ruling and it's not in your favor, then the next recourse that you have, you can lodge a, an in, internal administrative appeal. If you lose that, the next recourse is ADR. And if that fails, then your last is you go to court and the judge decides whether you, in your opinion, is right on a particular tariff heading or is customs right on their opinion. And I hope this video has been helpful to you in understanding classification and how important it is for you to have the right information in your product literature and making sure you get the product literature from your supplier so that you manage your risk of a non-compliance in wrongly classifying the goods because you don't have the, all the information that's required to classify those goods correctly. Thank you and bye.